Hi, I'm Georg Spell, and this is the presentation for our paper Mechanics-Aware Deformation of Yarn Pattern Geometry. This is joint work together with Rahul Narayan and Chris Voiton. The yarn structure of cloth gives rise to both mechanical and a beautiful visual complexity. For example, when stretching the cloth, the interaction of yarns pulling on each other results in distinct stretching resistance that depends on the structural pattern and is difficult to predict. But also, especially for knitted fabrics like this scarf, the yarns are a key part of the visual appeal. For these reasons, there is a lot of research on yarn level simulation and computer graphics, starting with the pioneering work by Calder et al, who proposed simulating si entire fabrics as individual yarns. The yarns are discretized as center lines of connected points, with physical forces for stretching, bending, and contact. This approach can achieve incredibly detailed simulation which unfortunately comes at a cost, and simulating a full garment may even take days or weeks. Sirio et al. proposed to model yarns with persistent contacts and mitigate the need for expensive collision detection between yarns. However, the degrees of freedom are overall on a similar order of magnitude, making simulation of entire garments still expensive. So in our previous paper, we pre-computed how yarn patterns behave on a coarse scale into continuum models. These models can be used in mesh-based simulation to reproduce the large-scale stretching and bending behavior of yarn-level cloth. Doing so circumvents yarn-level discretization and benefits from the efficiency of mesh-based simulation, making it orders of magnitude faster for large garments. But while we were able to reproduce key mechanical behavior of the cloth, we lose beautiful yarn-level detail. We would like to combine these two things, the efficiency of mesh-based simulation and the detail of yarn-level geometry we can think of a couple of ways how to do this. One way is texture mapping. Working with periodic patterns, we can simply make an image projection of the yarn geometry and tile this image over the mesh. Quite clearly, this doesn't hold up for close-ups or large yarns. It both looks too flat, and also when the cloth is stretched, the entire texture stretches with it, which arbitrarily deforms the width of the yarns. A better approach would be embedded mapping. Assuming that we have an animated deformed mesh on the right and the flat reference layout on the left, then we can tile the periodic pattern over the flat layout, very similar to texture mapping, but instead of an image, we tile the actual yarn geometry itself. Then we can simply transform the yarn geometry, for example using barycentric coordinates of each yarn vertex within its associated triangle, and map it from the undeformed version of the triangle to the deformed version of the triangle. The thickness of the pattern is mapped by the mesh normal. And with this, we easily convert the cloth mesh into 3D yarn geometry. Compared to yarn level or even mesh simulation, the cost of mapping the geometry is negligible, and it's also trivially parallel and stable. This type of approach was, for example, used by Montessori et al. for rendering woven cloth. And this can work very well for stiffer cloth. But in our knit example here, we see that stretching the mesh also scales the distance between yarns. Instead of the yarns tightening up, they're not even in contact anymore. What we want is a mechanics-aware approach, adding local yarn interactions back based on the cloth deformation and in a way that is consistent with physical simulation, but with the efficiency of the embedded approach. In this case, the yarn should tighten when the cloth is being stretched, similar to the real-life footage from before. And so the question is, how can we get this if we just have deformation information on the scale of the cloth mesh? We settled on a data-driven approach. With our previous method, we took periodic yarn patterns and computed how the yarns adapt locally subject to different large-scale deformations, for example by tightening. We then measured elastic energies to fit a mechanical model per pattern for mesh simulation. But this periodic pattern deformation gives us exactly those local details we want, and we can instead store the deformed yarn geometry itself. Now we can combine this with embedded mapping by interpolating and adding the pre-computed local detail depending on the cloth deformation which makes the embedded approach mechanics-aware. To give an overview of our method, we first have the pre-computation phase, where we use physical simulations to pre-compute the response of a tiny patch of a pattern to different deformations. Since the embedded mapping already takes care of the large-scale deformation of the geometry, we extract only the local yarn displacements. In the online stage, we start like the embedded approach, by tiling the periodic pattern over the undeformed flat layout of the cloth corresponding to individual garment parts, and then mapping it to the deformed configuration. We also illustrate these steps with a representative stretch triangle. 
We then compute the per triangle deformation of cloth and use it to look up the local displacement that correspond to that deformation. We add those local displacements to the undeformed layout and then perform the standard embedded map to get the combined deformation of yarn geometry. All operations on the yarn geometry after the initial tiling are trivially parallel per yarn vertex, and we implement them on the GPU, making the method real-time even for millions of vertices. And this allows us to animate this yarn armadillo chilling in a hammock with a couple million yarn vertices. Even though we limit ourselves to periodic yarn geometries, this approach of interpolating pre-simulated local details allows us to imitate yarn level simulation at basically only the cost of the underlying mesh simulation. The mechanics are where yarn detail is unconditionally stable in the sense that it can't blow up and it has negligible cost. In the following, I will provide details to a couple parts of our method. Starting with the pre-computation, I'll briefly review how we deform periodic patterns and then talk about an issue that arises when interpolating displacements for sliding yarns. To review our method for pattern deformation, we start with the undeformed configuration of a periodic yarn pattern whose centerline vertices we denote by capital X. We want to know how this pattern physically adapts to some large-scale deformation. If we only consider planar deformations, then we can describe this large-scale deformation as S times X, where S is some matrix encoding stretching along two directions and shearing. S is constant over the entire pattern, meaning that it moves all vertices uniformly, analogous to what we saw for embedded mapping. And we'll see a bit later in the presentation why in deformations alone are enough here. Then the final vertex position after physically adapting to S can be expressed as lowercase x, which is equal to S times x plus some displacements u. And we want to compute these displacements u such that the yarns are at equilibrium for some input deformation S. This basically amounts to newton raphson optimization for minimizing the total elastic energy E of the yarns, modeling stretching, bending, twisting, and collisions of yarn segments. This optimization should preserve the overall deformation S. We can express this by saying that the average gradient of X should be equal to S. With some simple manipulation, this can be transformed into periodic boundary conditions, where the displacements U plus on one side should match the displacements on the corresponding other side. Turning our attention back to the new method, since our, in the online phase the embedded mapping takes care of the large-scale deformation, we extract only the local displacement delta x from the optimized relaxed configuration, which we compute as s inverse times u. In other words, we transform only the local displacements u back into the undeformed frame by applying the inverse of the large-scale deformation. With this, we effectively create a database from deformations s to displacements delta x. Since S is parametrized by three independent variables for stretching along two directions and shearing, we can use trilinear interpolation to get the local displacement for any yarn vertex and any deformation. The optimization, as outlined, in some cases allows yarns to slide. For example, it would be perfectly fine with both the yarn on the left and the yarn on the right. Since in some cases the sliding does not affect the elastic energy, the minimization could arbitrarily choose different sliding even for similar deformations. We refer to this as parametric sliding, since this alludes to the fact that there is an arbitrary choice of a starting point to parametrize the yarn. But when we now go and interpolate these two, we instead get some pretty bad geometry that has little resemblance to the actual shape of the yarn. And here we can see how this looks when we use such data to animate geometry. For example, some collisions appear to be ignored entirely. Luckily, the solution to this is simple. Once we realized this was happening, we could just pin down this arbitrary starting point per yarn. Specifically, for each periodically connected component, here the gray and the black parts respectively, we pin as starting point some vertex that lies on the boundary and prohibit any movement normal to that boundary during the optimization. And with this, interpolation of the pre-computed data works out much better. This concludes the discussion of the pre-computation, and next we're going to look at the online stage. Specifically, I'll address two ideas about using and modifying the deformation with which we look up local displacements. One for using information about mesh bending when we've only pre-computed data for stretching, and one for limiting yarn buckling during compression. For each triangle of our animated mesh, we can compute its stretching and shearing deformation in terms of the first fundamental form, 
To look up local displacements, we first interpolate this deformation data to yarn vertices from nearby triangles, and we then convert it to the lookup deformation S, and finally interpolate the displacement data. However, it turns out that for thicker patterns, stretching information alone is not enough. Here, I'm toggling back and forth between yarns displaced when using only stretching information versus including bending information. We can see as a difference that yarns tighten a bit more in curved regions at the top when bending data is available. It also turns out that including bending both requires a lot more data in the pre-computation and it also negatively affects performance as we need to interpolate in a higher dimensional space. Luckily, there's an approximation we can use that allows us to incorporate bending information while maintaining only planar deformations in the pre-computation and lookup. In addition to the first fundamental forms, we also compute second fundamental forms that encode bending for each triangle and similarly interpolate them to the yarn vertices. Then there is a simple linearization saying that we can compute a first fundamental form that depends on the height h of a vertex within its pattern, which modifies the first fundamental form by subtracting 2 times h times the second fundamental form. And from this, we compute s as before and interpolate our displacements. To provide more insight on the linearization, here we're looking at some pattern from the side. That is, the horizontal line here corresponds to the periodic plane of the pattern, and vertically, we have the height of the pattern. For this bending deformation here, we can note that there is some stretching happening on the top and some compression happening on the bottom. Then, to illustrate the linearization on the right, this basically flattens out the bending while effectively converting it to the stretching and compression depending on height, like we saw on the left. And so we can compare no bending versus our linearization, and we see that we do get the tightening behavior in curved regions of the pattern. And similarly, we compare the linearization against the full bending model. Interestingly, the linearization tightens the nits a bit more than the full bending model, but there are also some caveats to what the full model is, which we detail in our paper. Talking about modifying the lookup deformation, the other topic I want to address is pattern buckling. Here, we have a yarn pattern with two compressive deformations that look almost identical. When we now run the elastic optimization, yarns fold over each other because of collisions and because the yarns want to maintain their lengths. But the resulting order can be arbitrary, as we see in the second animation. This bifurcation behavior can lead to undesirable popping artifacts when we use it naively as shown here. Since a more general solution for what is effectively a question of hysteresis is out of scope, we instead propose a simple heuristic. Before converting the first fundamental form into S in our lookup, we'll first clamp it and add a lower bound to its eigenvalues. This heuristic is cheap and also plays nicely with the linearized bending from before. This clamping also only tones down the local displacements while the large-scale deformation is unaffected, and we get a much smoother animation. And once more at the same time. Finally, a quick note on rendering. We render our yarns by tessellating the animated yarn central lines to cylinders. You can find more information on how to map physical yarn twisting in our supplementary document. We also add a procedurally twistable normal map to represent smaller ply and fiber level detail. Alternatively, one might consider the real-time fiber rendering method of Wu and Yuxel, or the method of Montezeri et al. for accurate path tracing. Let's now take a look at a couple of results produced with our method. We start with the example from the beginning, of a knitted cloth being stretched. Here, I'm toggling between naive embedded mapping and our mechanics-aware approach, and we can see that ours adds the important detail of knits tightening, which makes the cloth more transparent. Next, we look at a similar example, but for the thicker rib pattern. Toggling between naive and ours shows how our method allows the individual ribs to flatten under stretching.
Here, we compared the result to a ground truth yarn simulation, showing some remarkable similarity given how computationally efficient our method is. We get similar flattening of ribs on the outline and along the center. Note that the large scale similarity comes from using the course and simulation model of our previous paper. This example highlights the versatility of our method. We combine a mesh simulation on the top left with five different patterns. From the same input animation, we can produce a variety of mechanics aware yarn animations. Since our yarn animation is real time, even for millions of yarn vertices, we can combine it with real time mesh simulation for an interactive yarn experience. Here, we're interactively controlling the pulling force on the rim of a sock to pull it over a foot, and we get all the nice effects from before, like the ribs flattening. We again compare against naive embedding to highlight just how much local detail our method adds here. Now we'll look at the scalability of our method. In this example of a sweater with over 800,000 yarn vertices, our method runs interactively and only takes around 4 milliseconds per frame, on top of a pre-computed mesh simulation and excluding rendering. Even for 1.8 million yarn vertices, we're still sitting comfortably under 6 milliseconds per frame. And we can zoom in a bit to appreciate the yarn detail more closely. So as a stress test, we use a knit pattern with much smaller yarns, resulting in a total of 42 million yarn vertices. Even at this scale, the yarn animation is borderline interactive at 65 milliseconds per frame, around 14 frames per second without rendering and 4 frames per second with rendering. At such large scales, our naive tessellated yarn rendering actually becomes a bottleneck and suffers from aliasing. Finally, let's revisit our friend the yarn machillo. I threw this simulation together for the sake of the pun, but it turns out to be a nice example. I used automatic mesh-based methods to generate the flat layout of the armadillo, and then toyed around with cloth simulations in the 3D software Blender. And this means that I could use simple mesh-based tools like adding internal pressure to the armadillo to make it more pillowy, or quickly modifying pinned regions or stiffnesses, without needing to think about how to implement any of this in true yarn simulation or with regards to stability. Here it is animated one final time. So in summary, we pre-compute local yarn displacements for different deformations of a periodic pattern, which we then interpolate and add onto an animated cloth mesh. Our simplifying assumptions and heuristics, together with our GPU implementation, enable mechanics-aware yarn deformation in real time at large scales. In the future, it would be interesting to incorporate aperiodic elements, such as seams between different knitting patterns or garment parts, but also investigating a level of detail both for more performance and against aliasing at large scales. The code for both pre-computation and online stages is publicly available via our project page. Thanks for your attention.